On Halloween night, 1979, 16-year-old Shirley Lynette Ledford made one fatal mistake, trusting the two men who offered her a ride. 48 hours later, a jogger found her naked remains on a random front lawn in Sundale, California. Posed with her legs apart, her mutilated corpse lay in an ivy patch. No one could have imagined the horror she endured. No one wanted to. This was the doing of Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. These weren't just some crazy criminals. Pennsylvania-born Bittaker was found to have an IQ of 138 and was alleged the brains of the team, while Norris, who was from Colorado, was the muscle. The two met and became friends in the worst possible place men can go to make friends, prison. But how did they meet there? Was it fate or something else? To answer that, we have to dig deeper. Shortly after his birth, Lawrence was adopted by Mr. and Mrs. Bittaker. George worked in aircraft factories, which required the family to move often, from Pennsylvania to Florida to Ohio and finally to California. Even though he performed great academically, Bittaker dropped out of high school in 1957 after several run-ins with juvenile authorities and police. Shortly thereafter, he was picked up for car theft, leaving the scene of a hit-and-run accident and evading arrest. He was imprisoned in the California Youth Authority until he was 19. The FBI arrested Bittaker in Louisiana several days after his release for violating the Interstate Motor Vehicle Theft Act. Convicted in August of 1959, he was sentenced to 18 months in an Oklahoma federal reformatory. His behavior there soon got him transferred to a Missouri medical center. He was released after serving six months of his sentence. In his next conviction in 1960, a psychiatric evaluation determined Bittaker to be paranoid and borderline psychotic, with little control over his impulses. Despite these findings, he was released in 1963. Every time he was picked up and put into prison, he would be given a psychiatric evaluation and determined to be borderline psychotic. Multiple other convictions kept him in and out of jail, the worst one being the one where he was arrested when he stabbed a supermarket employee in the parking lot. Bittaker had stuffed a stake down his pants and the employee had followed him outside and tried to stop him. The man survived and Bittaker was convicted of attempted murder. He met Norris while in prison at the California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo. He was given another psychiatric evaluation which rejected the borderline psychotic findings, saying instead that he was a classic sociopath. Another psychiatrist called Bittaker a sophisticated psychopath. Despite the psychiatrist's warnings, he was released in November of 1978 and moved to Los Angeles. Like Bittaker, at 17, Norris dropped out of school, but he joined the Navy. He spent most of his service stationed in San Diego and served four months in Vietnam. He was first arrested in November of 1969. Three months later, out on bail before his trial, he was arrested again. He had tried to attack a woman in her home. Police arrived before he could harm her. At this point, Norris was discharged from the Navy for psychological problems. Things were about to get worse as Norris had a thing for hurting women. In 1970, he attacked a female student on the San Diego State University campus. Fortunately, the woman survived and Norris was sent to a Tescadero State Hospital as a sex offender and spent five years there. When released, he was considered no longer a danger to others, like all of his problems were magically gone, but they were not. Just three months out of jail, he attacked and sexually abused a 27-year-old woman. This time, he was sent to the California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo. Don't the police get tired of arresting the same people again and again? While there, he met and befriended Bittaker. Norris claims Bittaker saved his life twice in prison, which bound him to Bittaker according to the prisoner's code. The two men shared sexually violent fantasies, which led to a deadly pact. Upon release, they planned to sexually abuse, torture, and murder teenage girls, specifically one girl of each teenage year from 13 to 19. Norris was released in 1979 and moved in with his mother in Los Angeles. This is where it is believed he began an incestuous relationship. The most atrocious crime was about to start as Bittaker contacted Norris and continued their prison friendship on the outside.
They partnered up and hit the road in California in a van they chillingly nicknamed Murder Mac. From February to June 1979, this menacing duo picked up more than 20 female hitchhikers, not to assault, but to practice luring girls into the van. They also used this time to search for desolated locales. In April, they discovered a secluded fire road in the San Gabriel Mountains. Crowbar in hand, Bittaker snapped the lock on the gate to the fire road and replaced it with his own. All they needed now was a victim. They were basically searching for victims to torture and kill. Nothing more, nothing less. Their motives were rotten and nothing was going to stop them. Laura Brand, a criminologist who frequently appears throughout the Toolbox Killers on Peacock, met with Bittaker and he told her all about their vicious crimes. On June 24th, 16-year-old Lucinda Lynn Schaefer left her Presbyterian church meeting in Redondo Beach. She could not have known the evil that awaited her. After Bittaker and Norris had finished constructing the bed in the rear of the van, beneath which they placed tools, clothes, and a cooler filled with beer and soda, they drove to the beach around 7.45 p.m. Lucinda was walking down a side street, and Bittaker remarked, there's a cute little blonde. After a failed first attempt to lure her in with drugs and beer, he tried again, this time with force. That moment sealed her fate. With bound wrists and ankles, her mouth duct taped, Lucinda had no way to defend herself. What happened next was extremely graphic, so we'll not get into the details. Just know there was a lot of puncturing, tearing off the skin, strangling, and use of tools like an ice pick and sledgehammer. Their ways of torture and killing were always the same. While Norris freaked out and puked in the first murder, Bittaker was unfazed. Norris and Bittaker rolled Lucinda's dead body in a plastic shower curtain and tossed her into a canyon, where they expected wild animals to cover up their heinous act. Poor Lucinda wasn't alone. Between June and October of that year, the pair murdered five young women who ranged from the age of 13 to 18. Before murdering these girls, Bittaker and Norris brutalized them in calculated ways and often recorded the torture in what has been called acts of astonishing cruelty. Other victims included Andrea Hall, 18, Jacqueline Gilliam, 15, Jacqueline Lee Lamp, 13, and Shirley Lynette Ledford, 16. Investigators have not yet found the bodies of Schaefer or Hall. Norris was a prolific painter. Much of his artwork sent to Barbara Dickstein, often depicted his victims before and after they were tortured and murdered. He would paint clues into the artwork, some of which were incriminating and indicative of his crimes. Included in all of these paintings and drawings was his murderous calling card, a pair of pliers, which both men used as a torture device in the killings. In his letters to Barbara, Norris writes that he drew a number of hidden clues, purposefully left, but never found by police at one of the crime scenes. Laura Brand admitted, I only heard a 32 second clip of the Ledford tapes, and it felt like somebody was reaching inside of me and squeezing my insides. It was gut-wrenching. I was sick just from those mere seconds. This was a severe case of torture, even for serial killers. The toolbox terror that had gripped Californians ended on November 20th, 1979, when Bittaker and Norris were busted. The charges came about after Norris told a prison friend about his and Bittaker's crimes, and that friend, shaken by what he heard, went to authorities. Norris later flipped on Bittaker. Norris agreed to plead guilty and testify against Bittaker to avoid facing the death penalty. In April 1981, he was sentenced to 45 years to life in prison. He was eligible for parole in 2009, but declined to attend. He therefore automatically deferred his parole eligibility for another 10 years. Norris was denied parole in 2019 and died of natural causes on February 24, 2020 at the California Medical Facility. Laura Brand revealed before his death, Norris began to change his story, claiming he was under the influence of drugs when the murders were committed. Brand claimed that Bittaker had even more horrific plans before finally getting caught. He was going to buy acid to burn out the eardrums and eye sockets of his next victims, she said. He was going to build an underground compound to hold girls and torture them. And he believed he had the brains to pull it off. 
Bittaker faced 26 charges, including five counts of murder, five counts of kidnapping, criminal conspiracy, rape, oral copulation, sodomy, and being an ex-felon in the possession of a firearm. He was convicted on all counts and sentenced to death on March 22, 1981. Bittaker was always the crazier one. When he was not busy drafting appeals, he amused himself by filing frivolous suits against the state prison system. There were more than 40 in all by October 1995. In one case where he claimed he had been subjected to cruel and unusual punishment by getting a broken cookie on his lunch tray, state officials paid $5,000 to have the suit dismissed. Before the state was granted summary judgment, they had to prove that Bittaker could skip his lunch and still survive by only eating breakfast and dinner. It was all great fun and cost Bittaker nothing since California prisoners are permitted to file their suits for free. This guy sure had a lot of time on his hands. Five years before his death, Bittaker had begun talking to Mrs. Brand. The day she showed up seven and a half months pregnant, Bittaker produced a map of the San Gabriel Mountains, pointing her to where the bodies of Andrea Hall and Shirley Ledford were located. Searches are still ongoing. In the weeks leading up to his death, Brand described Bittaker as frail and said he was crying over his impending death.